to by far the coolest things of all. So we're going to talk about collision response and constraint resolution. So with the results of this lecture, you will be able, with a single piece of software, with a single piece of code, to handle not only the responses between the collisions of the object, but also the constraints between the object, such as the fact that two objects need to stay at a given distance, so connections between objects, uh, the fact that two objects cannot turn more than a certain angle. So you can build inverse kinematics, you can build do you know what inverse kinematics is? So with this, you can build a ragdoll system with the very same piece of code with which you do the collision response. All right? So just one thing, which of course you can imagine is not going to be very, very simple to explain. Uh, so before we start, I would like to show. Hello. I'd like to show a very basic, uh, a very basic example that I that I built uh, with this. So what you have here is a bunch of cubes. The system doesn't know they're cubes. It's using the SAT collision detection that you should be almost done with. Uh, these three cubes, their centers are connected. So this is very, very basic inverse kinematics. So if I push these, they move together. They move objects around. Uh, they can rotate around their centers. right? And you see that all the constraints are being solved at the same time. So oh, yeah, you see some vibration because there is a collision. Uh, because, yeah, the system is not the most stable you can have. You see that the, 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 the small cubes are being moved together. Did you see that? And at the same time, the constraints between these objects is respected, all right? And all of this playing with the forces, balancing the forces between the objects so that they are, the, so that no compenetration and no breaking of, of constraints happens. Okay, and since we're close to the, since we're close to the cliff, Right? So this is just a single piece of code handling everything, together with the fact that you have a ground. So the system doesn't know that there is a plane that, that's, the, that's ground. It's just another cube that has infinite mass and that is not subject to gravity. Right? And this is, go is what we're going to learn how to do today. Come on, that was kind of awesome. No, no, no. <laughs> Now, and the other reason I showed you that is that is the end of my efforts. Uh, it actually contains also assignment four done in there. These are the first four assignments, and I built them from scratch. So at least I can testify that yeah, to the end it's doable. All right. So come on, this is kind of encouraging to some extent. All right. So uh, what we're going to talk about in detail is going to be well, first of all, well, a bit of an overview of the problem of collision response. Then we'll talk about uh, constraint dynamics, what's a constraint, and how we can set up a bunch of constraints so that they, they, they handle uh, the various forces that, 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 you, that you need to balance to avoid, uh, to avoid breaking the logical flow of the engine. Uh, then we'll see the equations of motion restated with respect to the constraint solver. We'll talk about uh, how you solve a system of equations uh, numerically because that's actually the core of the collision, uh, the, the constraint resolution system. Then we'll talk a bit about uh, a very important optimization, which is contact caching, which is the reason why at some point my cubes were, uh, were, were wiggling a bit, and there is lots of constraints that, that change. Oh, one thing I forgot is that among the constraints you saw before, there is friction. The fact that when you have two cubes and one is pushing the other, their faces tend to do friction, and so even if they're not pushing each other perfectly straight, they actually stick together a little bit. And that, that is something that you saw. That was the reason why the pushing of cubes actually looked very natural. So this is all solved in terms of these constraint system. All right, so first of all, what's the point of the collision response system? Well, so what is that you want from your collision response system at a core? objects from going into each other. You want to prevent objects from going into each other, all right? Why do the objects try to go into each other? When does this happen? When they're colliding. When they're colliding. So when they have velocities that make them go into, uh, into one another, all right? So ideally, you have a direction of movement which is forbidden, which is the one that moves an object towards another. And what you want the collision response system to do is you want to create 
a counter velocity, an impulse, or a force that you apply over a single frame, which is strong enough to stop the velocity of the object from making it enter into the other one, right? Okay? So this very description applies to a series of things which we call the constraints, which is whenever we have a part of our velocity which is forbidden, right? So the objects tend to, to acquire some velocity, some movement, but when this movement tries to make the objects go one into the other, this is not allowed. So we need to find a counter a counterbalancing force that stops this from happening. Uh, friction is the very same thing, though. If you have an object moving in a direction, and part of this direction makes the object slide on another surface, then you want to counterbalance this force, right? Or if you have two objects linked together by an unbreakable link, and you're trying to move away from the link, then you need to counterbalance their velocity so that it doesn't break the linking constraint, all right? Do you see how this is always the same problem? So you have a piece of software that, in addition to the regular equations of motion, with which you are now experts and very familiar with, you also want to take the velocities that the, equational, uh, the, 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 the equations of motion produce <coughs> and make sure that you only keep the part of those velocities that doesn't break stuff. All right? Not vigorously, if, if this is clear. OK, the, the vigor is enough. So let, let's actually draw them as a, as a reminder. So the first one was, I don't remember. What was the, th the first one? What's the first constraint? That the objects should not go into each other. That the objects should not go into each other. So we have these two objects like this, right? And oh, this object is moving in this direction, right? Is this movement allowed? No. No, of course not. Which part of this movement is wrong? The right. The, the right part. So you have a part of this movement. This part here is wrong. Okay. Uh, these are wooden boxes, okay? So they have mass. Yeah, of course yeah. they have mass. But what else? Uh, give me. Is this box empty? Yes. Why does the object not fall right now? Friction. Friction. Friction right. So what do we have there? Friction. Friction. What part of the velocity is going to be counterbalanced by friction? Sorry? Up. Up, exactly. Why up? Why the up part? So this part here is going to be counterbalanced by friction because the object is trying to move. But while it moves upwards, it slides, right? C can you see this? OK. So this is one. OK. And let's also say that this object here is linked to another object here with an invisible link to another object here and this object is moving in this direction. So this object is effectively being pulled by the other. All right? So now the constraints need to be propagated to this object as well. Because if you're trying to if, if this object is trying to move but this other one is is, is locked by the is, is impeded by its movement by the collision, then the the, 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 the forward object cannot move as fast, right? If you're pulling something, the fact that it's stuck makes you stuck, all right? OK. And of course, the constraints over this object are going to be the very same one that apply to this one, OK? All right. So we, we roughly have them all. So contact constraints are these ones. The contact between these two, this is a contact constraint, all right? So this contact. Then the point of contact also causes friction. But whereas contact pushes objects away, friction forces them, uh, impedes their sliding movement. So the contact constraint and the friction constraint are actually going to be per per perpendicular. perpendicular to each other. Okay? And then we have this is a distance constraint. 
This means that the two objects cannot move further away from each other than the length of the, of the link. So you can imagine that's an unbreakable uh, quantum chain, okay, that you cannot break. And you can have something similar, like the two objects cannot move beyond a certain angle. So they can move, but only within a certain angle. And that, that counterbalances torque usually. It's hard to draw so one. Okay. And all of these are the same at their core. Objects try to move in ways you don't allow, right? And so the ideal collision response, which is the one we'll see today, deals with all of those. Oh, yeah. When I do this, please, and you see me looking around. Oh. Just <laughs> okay. So, boom. Now, this is actually something we won't do. Uh, this is something you could do, ideally. We, we won't read this, to, just to be very clear. You don't need to learn this by heart. You, you actually can, if you want. This is not very hard. Uh, so the most naive take to collision response would be that we have a constraint, you see. Is the constraint violated somehow? Yeah. Then you use the laws of conservation of <coughs> motion, plus you apply all these forces. And law of conservation of motion means that you apply a force F, which is computed like this, yeah, uh, to the points of collision. The yeah, the, 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 the no, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. But it is what you think it is, yes. And, and basically, you recompute the plus means that these are the velocities after the contact, uh, and the minus means that these are the velocities before the contact. Yeah, this shouldn't be a minus one. I'm, I'm gonna fix that. But so basically, what you do, you, you try to solve all the constraints in pair, in pairs. The, the hardest constraint, constraint to solve is the collision constraint. And when you have an interpenetration, you push away. Or when you have a breaking of a distance constraint, you push away. So you try for every constraint, you try to, to solve it in sequence. So you solve first constraint one, then constraint two, then constraint three, etc. But what happens? What happens with this? Well, why is this wrong? What's the biggest issue with solving? So the point is, this only talks about two objects, A and B. All right? Yeah. Well, uh, if you have the situation where maybe three boxes are uh, in, uh, in line and the middle one is pushing into the right one and the right one decides to push it back out, it might actually push it into the left one and then you exactly. keep on going until... Exactly. Then you, you actually end up, when you have counterbalancing constraints, like a stack of objects, or even, uh, what I should, the demo I showed before, you have friction, you have contact, and you have the three objects linked together, and you have gravity at the same time, so you have the, 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 the floor that's pushing, and that's causing friction, and then you have the three objects that try to stay at the same distance, and when, you, and when they get touched by multiple objects, so you have one of the three boxes touch, uh, touches another smaller box, and another of the big boxes touches another one, you get plenty of forces pushing in all the directions possible, and if you try to to violate these constraints and then solve them after they are violated, then you get horrible jittering and jiggling, or things that blow up, things that go more into each other. So when the amount of violation of constraint actually increases, then what happens is that at the next frame you have now a bigger constraint, which you're going to push even more, and which is going to violate the, uh, something else even, even more. So you have things that oscillate like <coughs> crazy until they spectacularly blow up. All right, so uh, it doesn't support stacking, but there is something to say. So uh, implementing this formula, you essentially just copy it down. This is fine, this is the inertia tensor, this is the normal of contact, this is the point of contact, the M is the mass, these are the initial velocities. So this, this is super easy to, to write. This can work in one scenario. For example, you have a space or a flight simulator. It can work. You have a context where um, there is not that many objects, so you won't have that many colli uh, collisions. And maybe whenever you have a collision, stuff blows up, right? So in this case, you, you don't really need very uh, precise responses, okay? So in very sparse, sparse scenarios, this may actually be fine. If you have multiple objects, like a room full of boxes or, or stuff that needs to topple and, and, and fall on top of each other, etc., then this doesn't work at all. There's another thing, another way we can try to solve this, which is an iterative solution which uses the same constraint resolution as before. So you resolve the, construct, uh, the constraints in pairs, but you keep doing the pair resolution during the same frame. So during a single frame, you keep, so, uh, so you, you, you apply all the constraints, you solve them 
And then you see, is there any constraint that's still violated? And if that's the case, then you solve it again. So, if you have a situation like this, <coughs> and this pool is going towards the middle one and the, the, the other one as well. So in this case, you will apply this constraint first. So let's say this is one and this is two. So what happens is, at first, you see that, well, oh, wait a second. Now they, they need to be also violated a bit. Yeah, something like this. This is the most evil case. And compenetrations do happen all the time. So you, we need to be able to solve them. So what you do is, yeah, you, you push these two away from each other. So now you have something like this. OK, now this is going here. And you push them away. But now you push the middle one to the right to solve the constraint. Can you see this? And so now you have a bigger violation. And the violation is very bad, because you're also going in this direction. And this one now gets a bit of movement. So now you have a very, uh, a very bad uh, broken constraint. But now you apply the thing again. Hello. And you apply the thing again. And now you have the, this ball doesn't move. The middle one gets pushed again, but the right one gets pushed to the right as well. So now this constraint here is less than what you had before. You keep doing this, and eventually, after a bunch of iterations, you get to the point where all the balls are separated. This one is going in this direction, this one is going in this direction. Okay? So you keep resolving the constraints, but this all happens during a single frame. Eventually, this converges, but how many steps does it take? So just for three objects, we need plenty of steps. Because every time you move the objects, they, they fall back into each other. So they, they keep jiggling. But you don't let the, the player see the jiggling. But the jiggling happens just during one frame. Do, do they lose any force? Because I would imagine that if you have a perfect scenario where uh, the, the balls are perfectly aligned, you will end up just going in an infinite loop because you'll Oh no, because uh, every time you... W no, because you... The first time, you push this one to the left and this one to the right. You push both of them. Right. So eventually, every time you apply this thing, this one goes more to the left and this one goes more to the right. So right. eventually, they move enough that the middle one has room enough to solve the final constraint and then they don't touch each other anymore. Uh, All right? Yeah. So you see the point. So we, we can't really find a solution right away. So we need to apply a bunch of steps. This is the concept of, of an interactive solution. You need to do something many times, and eventually it converges to the final result. It's clear so far. So ideally, you can try. You can try to build a system like this. It is very simple. It works. But its biggest shortcoming is that, first of all, it's not very accurate or very plausible. But second of all, it's going to be super, super slow. All right? But if you have very few objects, and if the situation where you have three objects touching together, touching each other, is rare, doesn't happen often, then you can actually get away with this. All right? It's a bit like the thing about the Euler integrator. In some cases, you may actually get away with it. So if your scenario is not complex and you don't need to put boxes on top of each other, then yeah, try. Maybe you get lucky. OK. All right. So. Indeed. Now, let's try a slightly better. Uh, let's try a slightly better take. Let's try the full constraint resolution system. Uh, first of all, let's remember that a rigid body is characterized by these two equations: the position, uh, the, the derivative with respect to time of the position is velocity, velocity and the derivative with respect to time of the Rot uh, rotation represented by quaternion Q, e Q is defined by a half times omega times Q. All right? These two equations should be something that you know very much by heart by now. All right? So these are the two fundamental dynamics that we need to remember. And we are going to keep using them. Now, let's put all of these, all of the velocities, so these are essentially, so the derivatives are essentially represented by the velocity and by the angular velocity, which, which is kind of obvious. I mean, the velocities are the derivatives with respect to time of our body. So we take all the velocities and we put them into a single <coughs> big vector, which we call V big, 
the capital, which contains the velocity and the angular velocity of the first body, the velocity and the angular velocity of the second body, and so on until the end body. Why do we put them together? Because we need to find a way to express all the constraints in a single big formula. And this formula will have to do with matrices. Big matrices. All right. Now, the other thing is at this point we build. So, so that's the reason why we start. And this is the description of the motion of the whole system, of all the bodies. All right? So this is the, the total amount of motion of all the bodies in the system. Now, let's see the constraints. The constraints, first of all, are we, we have a limitation. The constraints are only pairwise, so between pairs of objects. We do not support, if you want to try, you can try, uh, but we do not support more than two bodies interacting together at the same time. So you can have more, but then you have more constraints. So if you want to have body A interacting with body B and body B interacting with body C, you have two constraints. You can't have just one constraint. Ultimately, the system treats everything as, uh, as, as a big, uh, a, a unique big constraint, uh, constraint resolution. So this is not an issue. But indeed, this is the first assumption to make this workable. So let's say we have two bodies, I and J. One constraint, the K constraint, will say something, uh, will have this form, the, this shape. We have a function that with respect to position, rotation of the two objects has to usually be equal to zero. Being equal to zero means something like the interpenetration must be at least, uh, or at least equal to zero. We can say that the relative positions and rotations do not cause a penetration. So the amount, the total amount of penetration has to be zero. Okay? This is usually something that you start with that's broken. You usually start with the fact that some function of the positions and the rotations is not equal to zero, but you would like it to be equal to zero. And we can have, in a big vector, C, all the constraints together. Now, and this is extremely important, and this is a step that may not be completely intuitive, uh, we know that all the Cs, all the constraints, need to be equal to zero. So all the amounts of penetration, all the amounts of an object pushing another too much, uh, all the uh, amounts of velocities against friction, etc., are equal to zero. And so C is a big function that takes as input all the x's. So let's say something like this. C holds all the x's. And all the c's of the x, uh, of, so x is the, the positions and the rotations of all the objects, all of these constraints have to be equal to zero. Now this is a function, C, of the various bodies. What we do is we compute the derivative of this. And so by the chain rule, what happens is that the derivative with respect to time of C of x is going to be equal to j times v, v, where j is a big matrix. And this is all because the c, uh, because c is a, uh, because c is a unit function with respect to x. So what we get is that, oh, and of course, if c of x is equal to zero, then its derivative is still going to be equal to zero. So what we know is that if the amount of penetration has to be zero, then the amount of increased penetration, so the amount of movement into, uh, into the, the objects, the amount of, of further violation has to be zero as well. So all we have to do now is we have to compute the J matrix and find a, so find a way to compute the J matrix, which we'll do quickly. Finally, uh, what we need, what our system builds, is a series of reaction forces. And the reaction forces are the third ingredient, and they are one of the most important ones, we want to make sure that our system produces a series of forces that push the objects away from each other. And these forces happen in the direction of the constraint. So if you have two objects centering into each other, what the system will have to output is going to be a force that says, no, the objects are going to one another, push them apart by a certain force. And we call this force a constraint force, or a, uh, sorry, a reaction force, F of C, which is going to be, which is what we want to compute. We need to compute a reaction force, all right? This is, this is our goal, kind of obviously. 
so the objects try to move into each other, and the reaction forces are an approximation of the computation of the, 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 the physical bodies pushing one against each other, of the result of all the molecules, the molecules pushing uh, one another. Now, let's go back to what we knew about uh, the fact that we have some matrix J, which we compute from the constraints, but which we'll see in a moment. There's lots of ingredients, so be patient, uh, and then we'll try to, to give them a more reasonable explanation. We know that J, which is a matrix, multiplied by V has to be equal to zero. Now, if you remember, matrix times a vector is you take all the rows of the, rows of the matrix and you multiply by the vector, right, with a dot product. So this multiplication here means that we take all the rows, rows of J and we dot them with the V vector. And all of these have to be equal to zero. What does it mean then? This means that all the J's, or all the lines of J's, have to be their vectors. And if their dot product with V is zero, then what's their relationship with V? They're perpendicular. Yes, exactly. So wait a second, and, and what are the J's? I mean, how, how, many, how many lines of J do we have? We have one per constraint. So, the J matrix represents the violation of the constraints with respect to the current velocity. Now try to remember this, because this is fundamental. So every line of the J matrix is a constraint, right? But how so? Well, the dot product tells us, so, and, and, and every line of J is actually a direction. Now what direction is this? It's the direction of violation of constraint. So, whoa, wait a second. So, we have two objects, right? And this object is moving in this direction. This is the same drawing, just a, a bit bigger. And we have this constant contact constraint, right? What's the direction of the constraint? Come on, what's the direction? In what direction is this constraint going to cause a change of movement here? Yeah? Con contact constraint. So what's it going to push towards? Is it going to push up? No, to the right. Okay, and oh, why is why is it to the to the right or to the left? The face. No. No. Yep. Face normal. The face normal. So come on, that the pushing is going to be against the face normal, right? So let's say this is the normal. You can pick either actually because it's going to push in both directions and with, with opposite force. So this is the phase normal and this is the velocity. And what we really want to do and what we're asking, this is what we want to happen, is we want j times v to be equal to zero, right? What does that mean? Well, if j is something that has to do with the normal, and indeed it contains the normal among other things, what we're saying is that the dot product between v and n has to be equal to zero, right? Is this a reasonable request? What would that mean if we say j times v has to be equal to zero? What's v going to, to result? What, what's v going to end up as? Yeah, let's take our time. This is, when we understand this, we're done. The collision response system is, is understood. So, J contains the normal of the collision, all right? And we say that J dot V is equal to zero. This is our request. This is something that is not true when we start the collision response system. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we, we end up with only the friction. Oh yeah, ignore the friction, just, just the contact. But you, yes, the answer is right. You end up with just the velocity pointing. Exactly, so you're saying J times V, or in this case, N, N dot V, is not equal to zero. And that, that's right. We have a violation here, right? But you say if we want N dot V to be equal to zero. So we want a new V, let's call it V2, which is equal to zero. And, and let's call this V1. So what's V2 going to be like? What do you expect V2 to be? Uh, 
pointing up. Pointing up. And is it going to be like this? Why not? Because it's a collision. It removes <coughs> velocity. It doesn't increase. It doesn't push stuff. Okay. So this is going to be v2, right? It's going to be only the, the perpendicular part. Okay. And presumably, if 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 we want the energy to be conserved, then this will, this object is going to move with the rest of the velocity. All right. So well, when when we measure all of these dot products, and we have one for every constraint. So we have constraint 1, 2, 3, etc. through m, where m is the number of constraints. We're measuring how much our system is going in a direction where it's forbidden to go. How much it's going towards breaking the constraints even further. Okay? So if you get to the point of having a constraint here, it means that to some extent you are violating a constraint or very close to violating a constraint, like two objects very close to each other. And if the objects are very close to each other, they're touching, and the velocity is going into the normal, then come on, that's the time when you have to react, right? So nicely enough, we know that all the j's are perpendicular to v. So every constraint is perpendicular to the velocity. Oh, it has to be perpendicular to the velocity, right? And what we want is that the constraint forces, so the forces that our system produces, are all perpendicular to the velocities, to the final velocities as well. So we want essentially all the four, or alternatively, we want to make sure that all the forces are parallel to the various constraints, right? So the force, in this case, has to be along the normal, right? So the object doesn't accelerate just because it touches something. So the force goes against, goes only in the direction of the normal. So if I push an object like this, then yeah, come on. If, if the object is moving up, then the fact that I'm pushing it doesn't change anything whatsoever, right? It only changes the fact that the object doesn't move left or right or left. Okay? You see? So the constraint forces caused by my hands are perpendicular to the surface of contact. Right? So we know that all the constraint forces need to be, well, at the end, they need to be perpendicular to the velocities, first of all, and they need to be parallel to, uh, to, the, to the constraints. Now, let's stay on this one for a second more. What does it mean that the constraint forces at the end, so this is, the, we're writing all the things we want to be true. We know that they're not true at the, at the start, but they will be true when we're done with the, with the collision response. We say the constraint forces have to be perpendicular to the velocities. Why? What's the constraint force here? What's the direction of the constraint force? <laughs> exactly, so to cancel out the horizontal part. So the force is going to be horizontal, right? And it's going to be, so it's going to be parallel to n, or anti-parallel. So in this case, it's going to be in this direction, okay? This is Fc, okay? And when you compute the final velocity, the velocity that you say, okay, this is the right velocity, the body can go, it's free to move, then what we know is that the resulting velocity has to be perpendicular to the force that you apply. So essentially the force cancelled away all the part of the velocity that was violating the constraint. So when it's done, when the force is applied, then the, the, the object doesn't have any movement left in that direction. So what we're saying basically is that the forces we apply cancel out completely the part of the movement that's causing the constraint to be, to be violated. Which is kind of reasonable, right? Is this clear? All the movement into the wall is stopped, okay? So when the object is done, it flies, it's falling, so it's also got a bit of Oh wait, this is recorded and this is called property. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the object is moving in this direction, it's falling when it touches the wall, right? When the wall is done pushing the object away though, the only part of the velocity residual in the object is going to be the, the, the falling one, right? The object doesn't stop falling just because it touched the wall. So the, the, the constraint force is in this direction and the residual velocity of the object is in this direction. They are. All right? 
We're getting there. Oh, come on. Where did I leave him? Seriously. <laughs> there. <laughs> I'm making this hard on myself. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. So, come on, guys. You are the, the, the clicker people. Never lose track of this. <laughs> All right. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, yeah, this is a beautiful drawing. This best in its beauty. Yeah, this is actually better than, than my average. <laughs> oh, it doesn't say much about my average. So the point is that uh, if uh, this is another example. You have two objects and they're linked by an invisible, unbreakable quantum line between their centers, which is blue because it's blue because it's full of energy and it's vibrating, right? So the force is going to be parallel to the constraint. This is the constraint, right? This is the direction where the objects cannot move. So the force of the constraint is going to be parallel to that. The, the constraint doesn't, so the fact that the objects are linked, of course, doesn't push the object up or down. It only pushes it closer or further away, right? So the object can only go in this direction. If it, falls, if it tries to move in this direction, then the constraint is going to pull, pull it back. And if the object tries to get too close, then the constraint is going to push it away, all right? So the constraint is, in this case, just like the normal was before, this is the, the constraint specifies the direction in which we can apply the reaction force. So when we're done and the object keeps moving, the movement of the object will not be in this direction. Because if the collision response, the constraint resolution system, leaves the object moving in this direction, is this right? Is it right? Can it move in this direction after the collision response is done? No, because otherwise you break the quantum collision system, the quantum string, and then, then everything blows up horribly. So the only movement that we're allowed would be something like this. This is fine. <coughs> You can have an object that's falling, but you can't have an object moving in this direction or in this direction. Which is reasonable. Imagine they are linked together. What are they going to do? Well, they are going to, uh, and imagine this one cannot move. So this one is going to fall like this. And whenever it falls, all its movement is going to be perpendicular. Can you see it? So look at the tip. The tip is always perpendicular to the length of the marker. Okay? And the marker is. Oh, is the unbreakable link. Are you with me so far? Okay, so, don't worry. No, 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 seriously, don't worry. Now, we know that the forces, the collision forces, have to be perpendicular, have to, be perpendicular to V. And we have all the constraints, we know that they're already perpendicular to V. So the most natural choice is to say, okay, we want the forces to be parallel to the constraints. If the constraints are already perpendicular to V, then you don't need to look for any other directions. You have the normal, use the force along the normal. You have, uh, the, the, you have the, the, this axis here, use this as the axis for the force. So the final force that you apply to all the bodies is going to be some linear combination of all the directions in which you have the constraints, right? Draw something here. Okay. okay. Now, usual collision, all right? Plus, we have an unbreakable link. No, wait a second. This doesn't let the object move. Plus, we have an unbreakable link, something like this. Okay? All right. How many forces does our collision response system cause? How many forces does our collision response system cause? Three. Why three? Oh, gravity. Oh, no, we don't have gravity. Oh, oh. two then. Then two. Two. Which, one, uh, which ones? Uh, the friction. No, 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 no friction, just the uh, collision. The, the collision and the, the, the force. Okay, so we have the collision. So this is the normal. This is the, this is the direction of the axis, of, of the unbreakable axis. So you have the collision force. And then you <coughs> have this one, right? So this is one and this is two, all right? 
Okay? And, well, which one gets applied? This is a trick question. Yep. Both. Yes, both of them get applied. And how much? We don't know. That is the job of the collision response system to figure out how much of the competing forces you can apply. Right? You try to apply, you want to apply them all. Yes. You want to apply them all, but what you will end up applying is something like this. Fc1 multiplied by some value, lambda 1, plus Fc2 multiplied by some other value, lambda 2. Okay? Lambda, this is just a name to the, the amount of force that we apply. All right? And we know that these values are parallel to the various constraints. And the constraints, the lines of the J matrix, are the directions where the constraint is being violated. So, Presumably, FC1 is going to be in the direction of the first column of the, of the first line of the matrix. And presumably, FC2 is going to be the same thing <coughs> with respect to the second line. Okay? So basically, what we're saying is that we need to find how much we need to find the blending factors lambda for the various constraints. So the constraints, we know already the direction in which the constraints are pushing. It is in the constraint. The constraint just contains the direction in which the constraint can apply force to the objects. Normal or the direction of the axis. Or the direction of friction. Or whatever else you want. You can put any direction where a force is happening. Even a uh, You can even apply, uh, you can have a spring. A spring is a constraint which tries to apply a force. But if you're holding a spring, then yeah, it's trying, but if the other force is stronger, then the spring doesn't move, right? So what you need to find is the perfect balance, which is a bunch of values, lambda, which tell you how to blend the forces so that the end result solves the original constraints, but doesn't cause new ones. Because if you try to apply just the forces, then you're using the, the, the naive system that we presented at, at, at the start, but if you use that, then whenever you solve a constraint, you risk, and you often do, you risk creating a new, bigger one somewhere else. So what we do is we look for a single vector of coefficients, lambda, which are applied to the constraint resolution forces to make sure that the resulting constraint resolution forces are balanced together and do not break the constraints further. Okay? So in our case, what would happen is that the first constraint leaves the force to be like this, at least leaves the direction to be, oh sorry, leaves the direction to be, the, the velocity to be like this, but this velocity has to be perpendicular to the force, so this pole here cancels the other velocity and the object stands still, which is reasonable. C can you see this? So the object can only swing, but this one is stopping the object from swinging, so actually this object stops, which is correct, all right? Yeah? Do objects bounce a little bit from each other? Because normally they do. No, they don't. Okay. Very few objects bounce. Objects balance, but friction is a very strong force. Uh, now, let's see. I don't want to throw stuff to the ground. It's great. Table. <laughs> yeah, I was, think I was actually thinking about a table. Chair. Yeah, okay. Right, I'm gonna do this just once. Doesn't bounce, bounce that much. Yeah, but the most prevalent part of the movement of the chair is the friction of the legs, all right? So the most delicate thing to simulate is the fact that the chair doesn't slide on the ground, okay? And if you do this with boxes or full objects with high mass, we'll get very little bouncing. This system causes very little bounces, indeed, that is one of the limitations. Uh, you, you, you can make the objects bounce. But by default, without any additional thought, objects tend to not bounce. But bouncing is a very, very rare phenomenon in, in actual real life. So when you're pushing crates around and stuff, 
sliding, rotating because of sliding is a very complex phenomenon. So if you have a, if you push a box very strongly, it tends to rotate in a very complex manner because of the friction between the object and between the object and other surfaces. Friction is a very, very, very important property of physics in our experience. It's actually far more important than bouncing. All right. But in any case, yes, bouncing is something that by default we, we don't care about. Okay. So, at this point, but it is a very interesting point. Uh, so, at this point, our biggest question is, we want to compute the matrix of constraints from the collision system and from the, the rest of the response. And then we, f we solve, we look for the lambdas. From the lambdas, we, we sum all the rows of J by la multiplied by lambda. We compute the forces. And finally, we obtain the new velocity that the bodies need to get. All right? So this is the, the this is the thing we do. So J is a matrix, V is the, the original velocity vector, lambda is what we're looking for. With lambda, we can compute the final forces, and with the final forces we move the velocities and we're done. Oh yeah. Shall we take a break? Yeah. Let's take a break. Uh, of course you cannot apply the bounce after the collision response system, because otherwise the bounce may violate some constraint. So you need to fit somehow the bounce to the, co to, to, the, um, to the constraint resolution system itself. One of the ways to do this is, uh, there's, we'll see how you can feed the system the current external forces that are applied to the bodies, like gravity, for example, or the fact that there is an engine in a car that's pushing forward, right? So you, all, you have all these forces which represent additional desires that you have about the behavior of the, of the various objects. Among these, you can have the fact that when you see that two points are that you have a collision between bodies and you would like the bodies to bounce, you can apply an external force to the body, to the bodies, all right? So just like gravity, just like whatever else you want to have, bounces become another force, a very strong force, of course, because it has to be applied in the course of just one frame in the direction in the same direction of the constraint, so that force would actually help the constraint resolution system. Then the constraint resolution system considers the velocity of the object, all the external forces together with the bouncing force that you want, and tries to find the final output. It's going to try to respect your wishes, but it's certainly not going to break the physical constraints. Yes? When do you actually want to do uh, the resolution? You want to move one object and then check the collision and then no. All the objects, at the same time, you get all the constraints at the beginning of the frame before moving the objects. Then you get tunneling in some No, nope. you don't. Because all the objects, uh, first of all you do the collision detection system uh, with the velocities. So we saw how to project the velocity, the relative velocity of the objects across the separating axis. So that means that you know which objects are going to collide in the middle of the frame. So we already know what collisions are going to happen across the frame that we that would risk to cause the tunneling. So the tunneling is only caused by the collision detection system. And then you apply these as collision constraints in the frame. So if you have a constraint that happens because two objects are moving very fast uh, and they will touch each other roughly, say, at the end of the frame because they're moving very, very fast, that is a collision constraint. All the collisions that will happen during the course of the current frame, you give them to the constraint resolution system, and the constraint resolution system tells you what happens after the frame is left. So it tells you what the final four velocities that you can safely apply during the course of this frame are. All right? OK. So at this point, what we have to do is we have to determine the constraints themselves. But the constraints are nothing uh, worrying, and actually, they usually, okay, if you really want to read this, from here upward, I'm going to leave this in the slides, because this is how you derive the constraint. You start with the definition of how much you are violating the constraint. So this is one of these links here. You say, okay, the distance between these two points has to be equal to L. Okay, so you have points PI and PJ, and you say, uh, what I want is that the distance between PJ, the length of PJ minus PI, uh, or in this case it's square, but it's absolutely the same thing, 
and we divide by one half just because the derivation is convenient, is equal to zero. So you don't want any movements one into each other. You, you require this. You understand this, right? You say the distance between the two points connected by the, 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 the unbreakable string has to be always equal to L. So the difference between the square distance and L squared has to be obviously zero. OK? Right? OK. Now, when you do the derivation between these two things, what happens is that when you, when you derive, the positions, which are here, turn into velocities. The L disappears, and the positions appear once in front. And so you get the vector that goes from one to the other body. You have the vector that goes from pj minus pi, which is this vector here, and this is d, multiplied by, oh, sorry, the, yeah, the vector goes there, uh, dotted by the relative velocities of the two points. So, that's, so what we said is that the constraints, this, every one of these constraints will measure how much you try to take something that is broken and how much your velocities are making it even more broken, all right? And how much are the velocities breaking a constraint such as this one? It depends on the dot product of the relative velocities of points pi and pj with d. So if the subject now rotations come in, so first let's do it without angular velocities, and then we do it with angular velocities as well. So first of all, let's say we have points connected. So these are the centers of mass of our two objects, all right? Pj, Pi, okay? And these objects are moving in two directions. So we have Vi, and we have Vj, all right? Now, what we compute is Pj minus Pi, which we will call D, which is the direction of the constraint itself, uh, Pj minus Pi. This is vector D dotted, dotted with Vj minus Vi. What is this? Oh, crap. And this is normalized. No mistake. What is that? What's that dot product? Vj minus Vi. That's the relative velocity. So that's like saying how much they're moving relative to one another, as if one of them was standing still. Is it uh, projecting? Yes. Projecting along the collision factor? Exactly. So this tells us exactly how much the two objects are moving along the direction V. So this tells us exactly how much the objects are getting too close in a direction where they, or are moving along a direction where movement is forbidden, okay? In every case, we'll measure this. We'll see how much the objects are moving. This is just a dot product, indeed. How much the objects are moving along the direction, along the forbidden direction, right? This is the forbidden direction, and these are the velocities, okay? Now, Unfortunately, we have rotations, and rotations do not make things easier. So we have 
connected the center of mass of this object here with a corner of this object here, right? Ooh. And this object is moving in this direction. This one is moving in this direction, but this one is also rotating like this. Okay? The rotation, you can see the rotation is breaking the constraint as well, right? So the actual, so what we need to know is the velocity, not of the body, we need to know the velocity of the body at the point where the constraint is happening. All right? So we don't just need the velocity of the whole body. And how do, we, what's this velocity? So the velocity of Bj, we know that here we have Bj, we have omega j, so, and the center of the body is xj. What's the velocity of Bj? <coughs> Sorry? So the velocity of Bj usually, well usually, is always computed as Bj plus the angular velocity omega j crossed by Rj, which is the relative vector. Rj is the vector from the center of mass to the point where we're looking for. So this is the velocity. So this is the velocity that contains the the, 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 the the linear velocity plus the component that's rotating plus something that will make it go something like this, right? Okay, and this we should remember from two lectures ago. So the final total violation of the constraint also has to do with the rotational velocity. So it's exactly what you're seeing there. It is the direction d normalized dotted <coughs> with vj plus wj cross rj, which is the velocity of point pj minus the velocity of point pi, which is bi minus omega, so omega i cross ri. Which is exactly what you see there. Still with me? Okay, and now we take all of this and we try to factor out the velocities because we have the velocity vector and we want to remove the constraint part from the velocity part because we want to work only with the constraints and not with the constraints and the velocities together. So we take this exact same formula here, you can express it as this vector here minus d, minus ri cross d, d ri cross d, dotted with the various velocities. This and this are the exact same thing, all right? So we're just factoring out the velocities. So we're putting all the velocities here, and we're putting everything else here. So this <coughs> represents the direction of the constraint. This thing here represents, for a distance constraint, exactly the directions where the response force is going to move the words. So what we have captured is the fact that at a certain point, Pj and Pi, which is D, our objects are going to be pushed away by the response force by a factor that is proportional to this line here. And the total amount by which the constraint is being violated given the current velocity is the dot product between this and this, which is indeed exactly this one. All right? This is kind of intuitive, and this is the way we split it to be able to handle it. Now, this is a row of the J matrix. So the J matrix contains all the pairs, or all the constraints, all of the directions of the constraints. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and this, 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 is, this is the example. So P1 and P2 are the points where we have the, constraint, the distance constraint. X1 and X2 are the centers of mass. And R1 and R2 are the vectors that go from the center of mass to the point where the constraint is being applied. All right. 
Now we're abusing the, the, the notation a little bit. Uh, what we really do is that we have in a row of j zeros for all the bodies. We have only two bodies that collide that, that have take part in every constraint, i and j. So we have a long list of zeros. Then we have minus d minus r i times d in the position of body i. So we have um, i times six zeros here. Then we have six values which are not zero. These are two vectors. Six values which are not zero. Then we have another bunch of zeros for all the bodies between i and j because they don't take part in the constraint. So whatever these bodies do, we don't care. So we just put zeros in there. And then in position, uh, the position of body j, we have the six values here. And then we have the rest of zeros. And this line here is multiplied by the matrix B, which contains the velocities for all the bodies. But writing this, or writing this, is the exact same thing. But we're now aligning all the constraints together. So now all the constraints are aligned together. And this allows us to build the big matrix J. All right, how do we model contact constraints? Well, we do have the same thing. We want to ensure that the amount of penetration, so this is how much, this is the, dist the difference between the points of, con uh, of contact, xj plus rj minus xi minus ri, dotted by the normal of the collision. So this tells us how much we're violating, how much the objects are getting one into each other against along the normal. And we want this to be zero. And we also want the fact that they do not get any closer. So the resulting formula is that you take the velocities, vj plus omega j cross rj minus vi minus omega i cross ri dot the normal. So this is the relative velocity dotted by the normal. So how much the objects are moving towards the normal of collision, which is the part that we do not want to have. Yeah, once again, you have the center of mass, uh, you have the relative positions, you have the normal, and for the contact constraint, the line of J, the constraint is split between the positions and the velocities like this. This is exactly identical to the distance constraint. Can you see this? So instead of M, we had D before, and the constraint is the very same, because all the constraints are ultimately the very same thing. You have a direction, and you don't want the objects to move in that direction. And one part of the movement is caused by the linear movement, the other part of the movement is caused by the rotation. So the first entry, minus ni, tells us, gives us the direction that is going to be compared with the linear velocity, and this one tells us the direction that's going to be compared with the rotational velocity for the whole body, for two, the two bodies. And since you do a big dot product, you find how much the two bodies are getting into each other given their current linear and rotational velocities, uh, given their velocities and given their positions. All right. Now, one very important detail is that whereas for the distance constraints, you can push in all directions, you want the objects to be at the very same distance so at, at all times, so if the objects try to move away from each other, you put, pull them you, you pull them closer. If they try to move closer, you push them apart. For the consta contact constraints, you never really pull the objects into the contact, all right? So the force, the, the multiplier lambda for a contact constraint is always going to be bigger than zero. So you can only have a force, so you only allow a force that's positive. You don't allow a negative force, otherwise, you may get, for, for when the, the solver tries to solve everything at the same time, it may accept, if you don't put a constraint like this, it may say, okay, the, the global violation is very low, but these two objects will, will go one into the other. So we actually need to force the fact that the lambda, the multiplier for a contact force is always zero. All right, so, oh yes. We also allow the forces to actually perform a bit of work. So instead of just counterbalancing the velocities, we actually allow the forces to give a bit of velocity. Because we accept the fact that the objects may get a bit into one another. So we allow the response force to be bigger than the amount of velocities that it's compensating. Because if you have two objects one into each other, if you just counterbalance the force, they remain one into each other. 
So we add here another term, which is one per constraint, which is minus beta, which is a constant, which has to be smaller or equal to one divided by the current delta time, multiplied by how much the objects are one into each other. So you can have this constant that allows you to push the objects together. The bigger the beta, the more the force is allowed to, the beta is the magnitude of the force you allow uh, to be added to the system. How much the contact, the, the contact constraint can actually push an object that came into another away from it. If beta is very high, well, always within this, 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 the, within this bound, uh, then the resolution will be, will be quicker. But if, it's, but if it's too high, then the system tends to break down. So you see that the resolutions, the objects may fall into each other, and they're slowly and nicely pushed away from each other, but you can't have that too fast. Okay. Oh yeah, this is the last one. This is the friction constraint, and it's always the same. You have, you, you see that the, the shape is always the same. Minus ui, first before we had minus ni, and minus d. Minus ri times ui, so ui is the direction where you're applying friction, compared with the linear velocity and the cross product with the, the position of application for the rotational part. The only note about the friction constraint, this one you don't need to read and you don't strictly need to implement. Uh, the only thing to, remem to remember is that when you have two objects sliding on top of each other, you need to apply friction in two directions, the tangent and the binormal of the surface. Okay? So friction, a single point of contact for friction, uh, a single point of contact causes two friction constraints. One in the horizontal and one in the in the in the relative x-axis of the surface and one in the relative z-axis of the surface. Because when you have friction you don't have just one direction, you have two which are resisting. If well yeah. Uh, can you see me? So if you Oh yeah, I'll do this here. So if you have friction, the friction is going along the plane of friction, right? Along, along, along the surface. So friction is happening in this direction, but also towards the bottom. It's forcing me against the movement, all right? So friction always happens in two directions. You, you can put them together. Yeah, you, you, you can, if you want, put them together in just one. But this is the way it's advised to. The friction, this is also very important, uh, the friction is also bounded by the maximum friction force, which is given by the typical, uh, the mu is the coefficient of friction, multiplied by the mass, multiplied by gravity, or whatever other pushing forces that you get. Okay. Now at this point, I'm actually tempted to take another break. Is it too early? Then let's take another break before we, we see this one, because this is where it all comes to. First of all, let's do a quick poll. Who feels like crying? Okay, all right, all right. That, that's the typical reaction. Don't worry. You can, you can cry in these lectures. This is, this is a safe environment. <laughs> now, uh, before, uh, before we continue, uh, there is a very, very important note about the only way that, that I know of to get through this. Study the slides. No more. There, you, you actually need to study. There is nothing else. There is quaternions, there is uh, inertia tensors, uh, the collision detection part, this part especially. Only one way. Study. Give a name to stuff. Realize the fact that, yeah, lambda is just the multiplier, the magnitude of the force you apply, the constraint force. Understand that J contains, uh, every line of J contains the direction of constraint. But you have to understand this, you have to visualize this. And you only do this by studying. And you'll say, yeah, but you want to be a game programmer, I want to make games. Yeah, exactly. There's only one way. And if you really want to become a valuable professional, you need to be able to digest this stuff. Otherwise, you will be able to, yes, do gameplay, do basic rendering, do what you saw already, and keep doing that, keep repeating that for the rest of your careers, which is fine. You can be an amazing, in 10 years, 10 years from now, if you go this way, you'll be the best JavaScript game programmer that's ever existed. But if you really want to go the extra mile, if you really want to be indispensable, then you have to be able to look at something like this, look it in the eyes, and it's mathematical equations, and say, I got you.
learn how to study this, learn how to understand this, and learn how to translate this into code. Because everything of value, every, so I'm going to say this very clearly, everything of value that's going to happen to the game industry in the next five years is going to come in this form. It's not going to come in any other form. And if you have to be the ones who wait for the engines to be built by someone else, you will be less valuable than those people. Is this clear? If you can build the engine, then you are at the top of the food chain. If you have to wait for the engines, then you will not be put to work on the newest hardware. Because what engines exist for the newest hardware that's just released? How many? None. None, right? Some. Seriously, <laughs> come on. And the quality is usually perfect and they're perfectly tested. They're not. And what if someone invents an amazing technique for, I don't know, new physics, new ray tracing, new multiplayer, new AI? Do you think it's going to come in easy form? Do you think it's going to come in, uh, uh, include new magnificent AI, <laughs> run magnificent AI, that's it, two lines of code? It's not. So uh -huh. I, I, can, I understand the feeling of, but I just want to program. I happen to be 19 at some point in my life. It didn't last long, it just lasted a year. <laughs> <laughs> but this is far, far, far more valuable together with the desire and ability to, to, to actually build it, right? So, so I feel what you're feeling. I have gone through studying this myself from scratch. So nothing, no advantage whatsoever. But yeah, being able to do this is going to make a gigantic difference in your careers. But you'll need to study. It is desk time, not computer time. Print this stuff out and read and think and reason. And then the implementation is going to come supernaturally. It's actually not going to come out supernaturally. There's going to be open box. <laughs> but otherwise, you can't just go and, and look at stuff that doesn't work and try to hack your way through debugging it. No, you need, a, you need actual proper understanding of these things. Because how do you debug the J matrix? Let's say you forget a minus sign which is the thing I, the, the thing that I, I don't know how much of my life I lost to, to a minus sign in the J matrix. Multiple minus signs, actually. Uh, my system is completely backwards with respect to the paper, actually. So my constraints are negative instead of positive when they should be the opposite, which, which is the exact same thing. Uh, because I picked my directions in, in, in the opposite order, which is fine. Mathematically, it's absolutely the same. But when you write it, then things could push each other. So I had some constraints, the, the, um, the friction ones that were right, but the, the distance ones were wrong and the collision ones were right. So uh, you open the chain matrix in, in the, 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 the Visual Studio debugger and you see a bunch of numbers. Th that's it. <laughs> and uh, even for four contact points, four contact points mean four contact constraints, which means eight friction constraints. So you're already at 12 times six floating point numbers, all right? That means nothing whatsoever. <laughs> so the only thing you can do, essentially, the way you debug this stuff is that you go, you check the equations again, and you re-implement the system. Again, that's the only way. You can't really debug this. You, 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 you can draw debug vectors, whatever. Yeah, good luck. You can try, of course. But ultimately, it all boils down to go back, reason, Look at your code and try to find discrepancies between your implementation and the math you need to you need to, to, to understand. All right? And if you really, really can't make this, don't worry, you can get a seven without the second and third assignments. <laughs> but but do. Absolutely do. That that's just a way to, to avoid I don't want to break anyone's career here, so if you can't just do first, third and fourth assignments. Fourth first, fourth and fifth assignments. But please don't give up unless you're really about to, to, to really give up on life. Okay, so, now, once again, um, so let's go back. Now, at this point, we have the constraints in the J matrix. We have the velocities in the V matrix. Let's put everything to, uh, oh, and we know that eventually we'll have the uh, reaction forces and torques. Now, we can solve, uh, we know that the equations of motions are that M times the acceleration, the derivative of the velocity, is equal to the force, right? And the force is going to be equal to the external forces that the body is subject to, plus the counterbalancing force. 
right? So, the, so first you, you compute the counterbalancing force, friction, etc. You add that to the external force, like gravity, and you get the actual force the object is now subject to. And you do the same for the rotation. So you know that the inertia tensor, uh, the current inertia tensor, so rotation times the original inertia, inertia tensor times R, multiplied by the angular acceleration is equal to the angular force, which is equal to the angular response force, so how much the, ob the, the constraints are forcing the objects to rotate so that they move apart from each other, right? So I'm pushing this, this thing here, I'm causing a rotation rather than, rather than a movement, so I'm causing um, a reaction torque plus the original torque, okay? So we know this. But we have everything, so we want to work with the whole bodies because the constraint system works on the whole bodies. So we want to put together, we want to find the equations of motion for all the bodies. And we can do so by building a big matrix for all the bodies. This matrix, there is just nothing weird about it. You have the masses, so you have the masses in diagonal, M1, repeated three times. You have the inertia tensor for body one, and so on, <coughs> along the diagonal. Then for the nth body, you have its mass, three times. E3 by 3 is the identity matrix. And then you have the inertia tensor for the nth body. Imagine you have the forces, you multiply the force vector by this one, you get all the, uh, you get all the, sorry, you have the velocity, the, the accelerations, and you get all the forces. This is just a way to put these equations that we know are valid for a single body. This you have done. This is, a, this is the first assignment. This is the first lecture. You put them all together, in a, and, and you solve them, and you, you apply them just by multiplying the, 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 the velocities and accelerations of the bodies to the mass. To the, to the mass matrix. Okay, so we have this big matrix which contains all the masses, all the inertia tensors of all the bodies. <coughs> and this matrix is very easy to invert because it's a block diagonal matrix. So to invert this matrix, well, you just have one divided by the mass three times, the inverse inertia tensor, which we know how to compute for a body, R times I to the minus one times RT for every single body. So this is quick and easy to compute because you, you don't care about all the zeros. So what was zero here remains a zero in the inverted, uh, in the inverted big mass matrix. Then we define a single big vector for all the external forces. This is a big vector. Notice that just like for the velocity vectors, we had the linear velocities and the angular velocities in the vector. So everybody takes two slots in the vector. We have the same for the forces. So everybody takes two slots, the force and torque which are still forced, right? Okay, at this point we also know that the various forces are a linear combination, the, the, the constraint forces are a linear combination of the rows of J. The rows of J are the directions of the constraints, so the various constraint forces, uh, constraint response forces come from the lines of J, okay? Now, we can rewrite all the equations we had before uh, you can just write them down and, and see that it, it actually pans out. And we know that M multiplied by the acceleration is equal to the force, but the force is equal to the constraint response force, which is equal to J, J, T, uh, J transpose times lambda, plus the external force. And we also know that the amount of violation of constraint that we allow at maximum is some big vector epsilon, which should be equal to zero, but if we want to be able to push the objects apart, then we allow a very small epsilon. All right? So what we're doing is we're saying, OK, for all the bodies, we can put together in a relationship the, metric, the, 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 the big matrix of masses for all the bodies, the velocity, the, the derivative of the velocity, which has to be equal to all the forces that all the bodies are sub subject to. So we have something that describes not only the motion of the bodies, but also the constraints, all at the same time. So we have put together the external forces, the constraints, and the current velocities of the body. And we have something all together. But the problem is that, OK, what, what do we know? We know m, we know j, we know the initial velocity, but that's not what we're looking for, because what we, this is the velocity we want. And we have the external forces. What we don't know is, we don't know lambda, we don't know how much of the forces are allowed to stay. We don't know the new forces, the new velocities, 
So, and of course, if we don't know the new velocities, then we don't know the derivative of the velocities, okay, because we have no idea. So we have three unknowns, but fortunately they are, they are all linked together. So, we approximate the derivative of the velocity by the new velocity, which we do not know. This is what we're looking for. The end result of this is the new velocity, right? We, we just care about the new velocities of the bodies. Minus the current velocity, this we know, that's good. Divided by the delta time, so we're doing a first order approximation of the acceleration. And then we substitute. And when we substitute, uh, th this is just a substitution of, uh, in the derivative of the velocity, we substitute this. So now we get m times v2 minus v1 divided by delta time is equal to jt lambda plus fx. And here we have jv2 is equal to epsilon. Now we have how many how many unknowns do we have in these equations? Yeah, v2 is an unknown and lambda. and lambda. So we don't know the resulting forces, and of course we don't know the lambdas. We don't know how much constraint forces to apply. These are the things we know. And which one do we compute first? Lambda. lambda. So first we compute the reaction forces. And then with the reaction forces, well, come on, if you have the reaction forces, then, then you, 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 you can compute V2 very easily with a single step avoider or a wrong equity integration. So we get these two results, we put them together, and the final thing that we have to solve is this. Now, the most important thing from, these are just substitutions, so these terms at some point uh, no, but they actually have some, some deep meaning which we'll talk about. But the point is that we keep playing with this until we get something that's in a very specific form. So we do a bunch of, uh, a bunch of substitutions and, uh, and of transformations and we get to the point where we have epsilon divided by delta time minus j times the current velocity minus delta times times j divided by m multiplied by the force is equal to j min m minus 1 j times lambda. Now, this seems like a monstrosity, right? It isn't. Epsilon divided by delta time. Epsilon is the vector that contains how much compenetrations are happening that we don't want, all right? So how much objects are violating the constraints? This happens. It happens because, well, we're still solving an approximated system. So, so some violations will happen, some compenetrations will happen. Things will move, numerical errors mostly, but lots of things will cause objects to move into each other. So epsilon is a measure in meters. How much? compenetrations you have, right? Meters divided by seconds, because of course uh, you want to push against these compenetrations, right? So the first part of the velocity that we want to have, we're computing the, 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 the pushback factors. The first part of these pushback factors is proportional to how much you're violating stuff. So we're writing things that should happen. And first thing that should happen is that if you have a compenetration, you push, depending on how much you're compenetrating, you push away, all right? Minus j times v1. Well, minus the current velocities. You have the current velocities. These are desired velocities and these are the current velocities. Minus, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, the, the, this is in seconds, right? J is just a bunch of factors. These are just a bunch of multiplicative factors. The velocity, what, what's the unit of measure of the velocity? Seriously, guys? Uh, very good. Meters per second. Very good. So yeah, we were saying, this is the velocity we would like, and, but remember, this is the velocity you have already. So if, if this velocity is already going in the right direction, then, 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 then you don't need anything from this one. Minus yeah. delta times multiplied by j, which is just a factor, just a multiplicative constant, multiplied by the inverse mass, multiplied by the external forces. What's the unit of measure of this term? Mm 
So let's start with delta time. What's the unit of measure of delta time? Seconds. Second. Seconds. Very good. What's the unit of measure of the inverse mass? Inverse. One over kilograms. One over kilograms. In approximation, because we also have the inertia tensor, but but it's fine. Then let's just think about the linear part. Then what's the unit of measure of the force? Newtons. Newtons. Yeah. Okay. But newtons are actually expressed in kilograms. Kilograms. Per meter per second. Meters over seconds. You sure? Yes. Wait a second. Let's put all these together. What, what comes out? Whoa. It's almost by magic that what comes out is? Yeah. Meters per second. So what we're saying is we're saying, OK, uh, this is the current velocity. Yeah? And this is the current velocity coming from the external force, right? During the current frame. We have, we're, we're talking about a single frame that lasts all the time. So we have the current force. But this force is causing a new velocity. We're, we're actually simulating a, a, an Euler step. You see, this is actually the simulation of an Euler step. The system is not performing an Euler step, but it's saying, wait a second, what if I did an Euler, an Euler step? This is the velocity I would get, but this is how much I should be moving away, because this is how much the objects are compenetrating. So in this frame, I should, the objects are compenetrating by one meter, and the current delta time is one second, so the objects should be moving one meter per second away. And in reality, this, these are all the errors that we're making, given the, 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 given the constraints that we're breaking. And this has to be equal to j m minus 1, j transpose. So the j's here are actually just a way to project all, the, all, all, the, all, the, all our reasoning is projected along the lines of the constraints multiplied by lambdas, which are the current force, the current, uh, the current forces applied during the spring. So what we're saying is that when you, so this will end up being in meters per second. So what we are saying here is that the result of applying all the forces makes sure that we are moving in the right direction, knowing the current direction we're moving in towards. So you see all this? We are actually just computing, la computing lambda, which is the new velocities that you have to apply to push the objects so that you counterbalance what's left from V1 and Fx, which are the external forces, to make sure that these do not violate the constraints in the frame. This is actually awesome. Because you're doing this for all the bodies and all the constraints at the same time. So you have just one big formula that's capable of tracking all the constraints. But let's reason even further. This is a vector. This is matrix times vector. So this is a vector. Kind of obviously, otherwise you couldn't, you couldn't uh, sum them. This is, OK, matrix times matrix. This is a matrix times a vector. So this is a vector. Woo! All right. Matrix, 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 times vector. So this is a vector. Very good. So this thing has the shape of this matrix here, which we call A. And this is just one big vector, which we call B. All right? So what we have, this we can compute. Epsilon we compute from how much you're violating the constraints. J we compute from the constraints themselves. V1 are the current velocities. Uh, that time, obviously, we know. M to the minus 1 is kind of obvious. It's just a matrix that we can easily compute from the body structure, from the body masses. The external forces we know, a gravity, user pushing, whatever else. So this vector here, B, we can compute. This matrix here, well, we know J. We can compute J transpose from J. And we know the masses. So matrix A, we can compute as well. What we don't know is lambda. So we have something of the form A times <coughs> lambda equal to B. Or we usually A times X equal to B. So now, if we can find an X that multiplied by A is equal to RB, then what we get in X is all the response forces. All right? Now breathe a bit. Feel the awesomeness coming into your lungs. All right? And it takes a few seconds before the awesomeness that you breathe it goes to the brain. So 
little bit of time. So, we have reduced everything to the fact of solving a linear system which puts together all the relationships between the object positions and their velocities and their external forces and knows everything and it says, okay, what if I did an Euler step? How much stuff would break? And what you get with X is how much you need to push back to make sure that it doesn't break during the current frame. So what the lambdas are, are not exactly forces. The lambdas have to be forces multiplied by time. Otherwise the units of measure do not, do not work correctly. This, as a side note, is something that no one says in the papers. There went three nights. And, yeah, okay. So seriously, no one ever notices. The, the lambdas are, yes, constants that are kind of like pushback forces, but they're not forces. They're forces multiplied by delta time. So if you multiply lambda by delta time, everything breaks miserably, as you would kind of tend to do. Yeah, because then you apply something that's far, far too small to, to counterbalance. So, how much time do you have left? No, five minutes. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Oh yeah. Well, first of all, uh, just notice that in this system you have infinite possible solutions because the constraints are redundant. Uh, the, the typical example is that a table with more than three legs. Uh, there is lots. There is infinite combinations of forces that account that balance the the, the, the table. So you, we just find one of those solutions. So the system is, the, the, the thing is very redundant. The other thing is that, assume that we can solve this. So imagine, we can solve this system. So we compute the lambda. At this point, we determine the constraint forces. Then we determine the actual forces, which are the constraint forces plus the external forces. And then we can do the final integration, get the final velocities, and then you integrate the positions with the final velocities. But remember, we were lying a bit when we talked about kilograms because there's also the rotational part. So what you get also is the rotational responses all together. All right? So once again. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, this is what I just said. So you can treat this as the, this is just a big vector B. That's just a big matrix A. And this is our, uh, our unknown. This is what we're looking to solve. So now the rest of the lecture talks about how to solve this given matrix A and vector B. And we can solve them with a method such as projected gauss seidel which is incredibly simple to write. These are 10 lines of code. Oh, do you, yeah, 10 lines. These are three lines of code. This is the solution to gauss seidel This is how you solve a linear system. You have the matrix A, you have vector B. Every time you, 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 you take every line, you multiply the line of the matrix by the, the, the current vector, you compare against B, you see how much you're off, and you, you reassign X. X I. And th this is like super stupid. You keep saying, no, the, the XI should be equal to 10. It's equal to 11. So no, put it to 10. And you keep doing this, and after like 10 to 100 iterations, in, or even, even sooner, you get to the, to the answer. But remember, uh, we're, we're solving for our lambdas, Every lambda may have a minimum and a maximum allowed value. For example, when the lambda is talking about a constraint force, then lambda cannot be smaller than zero. So every time you reassign a value, you clamp it between its, uh, between its minimum and, and, and its maximum. And that's it. Uh, no, we're... Okay, I'm, I'm going to say this for completeness. Uh, by the way, the clamping is what turns gauss seidel into projected gauss seidel because you're projecting the solution in the, in the allowed range. Uh, now, a few notes. These are minor notes. Remember that the matrix A, this matrix here, is completed with J, but J contains, every line of J contains mostly zeros. Do you remember? Because uh, it only has to do with two bodies. So these are mostly zeros. So the matrix A, the result of, of this multiplication, is still going to contain mostly zeros. So when you're doing the summation of a line of matrix A multiplied by X, you can already skip the zeros if you, if you only know the six indices of the non-zero elements. So if you have like 100 bodies, that means that matrix A for every row has 600 floating point values. But for every of these operations, you only need six. 
and all the remaining 594 are zeros. All right? So you're simply multiplying zero by something a lot of times and adding that, which you can imagine what result gives. Multiplying zero by something gives. Zero. And adding zero to something else gives. Nothing. Something nothing, else. Which is kind of pointless, right? Because the computer still has to do the full multiplication of floating point values. And, and that's something that, yeah, it's kind of depressing. So you can do uh, this. Uh, oh, yeah, this is some good news. This is just a programming task. You just track the values which are not zero. And that's it. This can give you a boost that, from my own experience, is kind of impressive. So you can go from 5 to 10 frames per second to 30, which is nice. I mean, yeah, it's like six times faster. OK. Uh, also, if you cache the previous lambda, and you feed it back into the solver. So instead of so starting from, from, from random, you, you can start from lambdas all equal to zero, and then the, the constraint solver is going to figure out the right values. So you, you cannot care. But if you want to obtain always the same forces, so you want the, frame, the system to behave in similar ways from frame to frame, you could save the previous contact forces and use them as the starting point that you give to, 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 the, to the solver algorithm. So basically, you let the algorithm restart from its previous uh, from its previous solution, this is not mandatory. But if you want to achieve stable stacking, then it actually is very important because it, the reason why my my little cubes uh, wiggle a little is that every frame I'm finding a different lambda vector. So you still get valid solutions, but they're always a little different. So if you have lots of constraints, then every time the system you have infinite solutions, right? Because we said that before, you have infinite solutions, and every time you get a, a different one of those infinite solutions because the starting point is a little different. So you kind of help the system converge to the same to the same solution. Oh yeah, but just be aware that this requires fairly much bookkeeping. So you need to store a cache of all the previous contact points. And when it finds two contact points, you need to find, okay, but these two contact points are very close to the old ones. So yeah, they start with the same lambda. You can do this, but it's it's hard to build in practice, and if you attempt it, yes, the chances of success will be will be kind of low. But be aware that this is something that exists, and it's called contact caching. Oh, yeah, okay. So the lecture is over, and we're perfectly on time for once. We really are, actually. Yeah, okay. So before the end of next week, uh, group work, archive, video, and report on that school or upload it somewhere else and link to the report uh, and yeah, and the individual report on that school. Build a collision response system that supports collisions between multiple objects. You can try the naive one, but that doesn't score as much as the full collision response, of course. And it's far less awesome, so yeah. <laughs> All right, so once again, this lecture is over. Thanks a lot for the attention, and I'm absolutely exhausted now. <laughs> <laughs>